Hey, welcome to the Kinship Collective. My name is Mark Fields. I'm the host and we gather in this kind of digital space to end otherness. We believe we do that by celebrating your story, by celebrating complex stories filled with uh, complexities and traumas and uh, I want to say diversity, all kinds of words for like the complexities that we hold came through my mind right there. But we want to celebrate stories and we want to reimagine scripture. We believe that the scripture is a place where we understand what it means to be human and the nature of God. And, and we're invited into that story. And sometimes it's framed in a ways that exclude us or make us feel like we're not welcome. And I, I we believe that Jesus welcomes everyone to the table. As one guest said that he leaves no room for someone to feel excluded. And so we want to do that today. Today, we're here with our guest who has 30 plus years of leadership experience. We want to ask him about what does it look like to lead during change? Um, I think the fruit of his life uh, can testify to who he is. He has a doctorate from USC. Would you welcome from somewhere in Southern California, undisclosed so you cannot stalk him, Ed, Dr. Ed Barron. Right on, Mark. Thank you, man. Thank you. It's good to be here this morning. How are you? Come on, man. I'm I'm thankful. I'm as very I, thankful. As I like to say, how are you showing up today, man? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I think I'm showing up. I'm showing up pretty well, actually. I've I've done my work this morning to right be on. able to show up well. Right on. Right on. Yeah. yeah. That, that's kind of a that's kind of the best indicator of of godliness in us is how we show up. Doesn't mean you have to be on all the time. Mm -hmm. but we need to be authentic all the time, right? Mm. So that's, that's kind of this trademark, man, you showing up. So anyway, brother, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. The Kinship, kinship Collective. That's right. That's right. Wow. I Come like on. that. I like that. We, 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 a collective of people, a group of people who are gathering to remind one another that we are family. This is kin. Yeah. Yeah. So there is no us in them. There's just us. Yeah. It's always been family. It will always be family. And we have work to do to make it feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. My mom and dad took me out of the country, but you can't take the country out of me. So that whole can idea. Come on. Man, that Come on. Yeah. Right on. Well, I'm glad to be here. Come on. Ed, what, what did I forget in my introduction? Talk to us a little bit about your journey to how you came to be who you are now. Oh, listen, man, I'm, I'm, I'm entering or have entered the sixth decade of my life. I like saying it that way because it doesn't make me sound so old. <laughs> so there's, there's far too much right there to cover. So let me say this, man, I am uh, fortunate to have experienced a lot of things in my life. I think the diversity and variety of my relationships, my educational experiences, my professional experiences, all of which have been kind of summative and formative, right, that have made me who I am. I'm innately uh, curious. I'm an insatiable reader. I love to just intake. I'm a uh, sort of active collaborator, extrovert by nature, but don't, don't get it twisted, man. I love a quiet cup of coffee on my balcony with a book, right, which I consider collaboration. Don't get me wrong, right? I'm collaborating with somebody that took the time to put their thoughts down. Um, I love fitness, I love to cycle, I love to get my lift on. Uh, I really think that resistance builds strength, so I like to model that intellectually and physically. And, um, and I love Casablanca, that's my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen Casablanca, I'm thinking oh, come about- on. Come on. <laughs> my favorite movie of all time, I think is Gladiator. A lot of those Russell Crowe man, with character against the system. Mm -hmm. So I like um, the boxing one with him, Cinderella Man. Cinderella Man, yeah. And yeah. Gladiator, Those, that's my, that's my little, yeah. that's my world right there. Well, if you just want pure cinematography, great writing, deep story, a little political intrigue, Ooh. and a, a kind of a, a dashing lead and a beautiful um, side, uh, check out Casablanca, man. I get no money for that advertisement, so it wasn't paid. I just like the movie. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Ed, I, I think about um, your experience in leadership and the ways that you've been in organizations um, that lead. I feel like I'm jumping straight from Casablanca into some of your expertise. Great um, But um, when I think about leadership, I, I am curious about 
I think when I first read about leadership, it was influence. Uh, leadership is influence. John Maxwell, I think, framed a lot of the ways that I thought about leadership. Um, then I, and I, I've lived, and I think it still is, is influence. Um, but I think I've come to a, a different understanding of leadership now. I want to hear your definition before I kind of, because I think my, my now definition has less to do with what it is and more to do with how I get there. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great observation, Mark. So, so let me say that, that leadership is probably uh, the most discussed, researched, talked about human phenomenon and maybe the least understood and therefore the poorest practiced uh, because it resonates with all of us, right? We say leader and I, I'm a professor of leadership. I, I've got young students that want to be leaders and most of them, almost all of them say at the end of the journey, and I'm going to answer your question in a moment that I came in thinking leadership was one thing and I left thinking leadership's another thing, right? So we already had this this concept and framework of what leader is. And it's usually positional, somewhere that's at the top, the front, whatever the case might be. But I still think that leadership is, um, in essence, it is it is influence. So I would say that leadership is a transform, transformational experience that's, that's guided by influence, marked by collaboration, that ultimately changes something. So it leads somewhere. If the, if, the, if the interaction, if the collaboration doesn't result in something different, then it may have just been a nice walk in the park, right? Uh, so you can see with that definition, you can apply that to any aspect of living, your personal relationships, uh, your educational experience, your professional experience or whatever. But, and I say transformational because as we engage each other and in influence, it should be something that grows and, and morphs in us and makes us better, more insightful, more proactive, more future or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the transformational part of it. It should be mutual, right? So it's not just the leader transforming the follower. Mm -hmm. um, and I steeped in collaboration. So there should be this um, sort of interaction, mm -hmm. right? This, this, this back and forth. And then again, it should lead to something. So that would be my definition of leadership, which means anyone can participate in that. Absolutely. I, when you said that, I, I started to think about what uh, one of my colleagues talks about leadership is, you know, it's, it's not the idea. It is, it is evidenced by the followership. Mm -hmm. And so if you have to be going somewhere for somebody to follow you and all that. So my mind goes into that space. But I, when you started sharing, and as you shared, I started to think about the spaces where, um, where I shake my head because I think I'm, I'm thinking through immediately, I think about the people who have disqualified themselves from leadership, or they never thought of themselves as a leader, because they were invalidated when they were young, or they made a mistake on a on a sports team or a, a coach kind of down them or whatever. And then they've kind of, they've never been able to maybe visualize themselves as a leader. I'm thinking, so first, I thought about that person, then I thought about me, who as I grew up, I was, I was, I think about, and for those of, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking there's a Bible character that comes to my mind of how I was thought of. Um, I think about Saul, who was seen as the leader because he was tall and he looked like he had the leadership attributes, but some of his character wasn't there yet. And that was, that was me. And it, I don't, it wasn't always character because I think at some points I was too young to, to be accountable to a character, but I was, um, immature. Uh, and so I was viewed as a leader before my character could hold up the leadership. And now, like, as you shared about the transformational leading somewhere, collaboration, mutual leadership, I think about for me, I am, I am the invitation for me for maturity right now is leadership in my family. I'm 10 years into marriage. Mm -hmm. And it feels like I have led in other spaces really well. And I've tried to lead at home, but there has just been a, a gap somehow mm -hmm. um, because I grew up in a space where there wasn't a father who was a leader. And so my mother was the leader, the provider, the protector. She was the presence. She was all that. And so in my therapy and in my journey, I'm learning to take ownership back to the work. And how do I show up well in my family? How do I... Uh, be present? What does that look like? How am I providing? How am I protecting? Um, but I think about, so I'm thinking about specifically about those, the gaps where 
how much does my belief in myself as a leader, how much, and I'm starting to think about trust, but how much does belief affect leadership, that transformational journey somewhere? So why don't, why don't we walk that back and talk about, <laughs> and, and seriously, but, so what, so what, so when was the idea of leadership first formed in most of us, right? Mm -hmm. It was usually formed in most of us by observation of someone who had a station in life ahead of us. So maybe mm -hmm. that was a parent or a lack thereof. Maybe that was an educator. Maybe that was a coach. So all of a sudden now leadership is embodied, right? And we started, look, we started looking at leadership as a set of traits and strengths. And then we measure ourselves, consciously or otherwise, Mark, we measure ourselves against those things, right? It could be narratives, it could be the Hollywood leading man, it could be the pastor at the church. And those conversations may never sort of manifest, but we're having this sort of conversation with our, that's what leadership looks like. And then we start oh. to sort of practice in our own lives and make these determinations over how well we're measuring up, okay? Mm -hmm. so that, my friend, is the most faulty or fault riddled um, construct that we can adapt. Not that we shouldn't have models, not that we shouldn't learn from others, but nowhere in that description, Mark, was there any room for who are you, right? Who, who are you, right? So, so we encounter a lot of spaces where more attention is, is placed on um, belonging, uh, more emphasis is placed on behavior, right? Uh, more in, in, emphasis is placed on um, sort of believing, and you talked about believing, and we'll get to that, but not a lot of emphasis is based on being. So one of the foundational principles that I hold to in leadership is a leader must first learn to lead themselves. And so I have news for you. You will never reach a point in life where you've arrived. You, I, if you do have another podcast, man, let's talk about this, stop that up, right? Because you're always emerging, you're always de developing, at least that's the nature of life, right? Mm -hmm. So we have these sort of archetypical leadership or, or, or leaders in our lives, uh, either those we observe or those that we are told about, or those that we are told to be, right? And then we strike out to do that. And we have these gaps when we get disappointed and it stunts our growth, right? Mm -hmm. So, so my response to that is, okay, if you're going to be a leader, why don't let's, let's start with you talking about what that means in your context, right? Because your wife is different than any other wife on the face of the earth. I know this, right? I, I know this. DNA, fingerprints, you try to clone that chick, you can't because there's no one like her. Mm. Kids, mm -hmm. There are no one, no one like your children and there's no mm. one like you. So why don't we start contextually and talk about what, is, what does leadership look like in the context of your home? You mm -hmm. can't be like the dad that you didn't have because you didn't have the dad. Right. Okay, so that's not a gap. You got space to create your own. Mm -hmm. What does a conversation look like with those you are collaborating with? Remember, I talked about this collaborative relationship, right? That is mm -hmm. guided by influence that's going somewhere. Have we talked about what those things are? Have we, have, we, have we defined them? So this is the basic, this is the basic formula for organi organizational change and development. It's the same thing. Who are you? Where are you going? And how are you going to get there hmm. is the big framework, right? Mm -hmm. And so we beat ourselves up for not reaching a mark, for not reaching a platform, for not reaching a destination that we've not even clearly defined. I mean, you remember that, uh, I don't know if you, you guys ever played this before, the paper football game, you know, you fold a little triangle, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. post, right? And then you always played somebody who, you know, right before you kick the field goal, they moved post. <laughs> right? so, so that's, that's right. That's what this journey looks like for you. If you don't know the destination, the post move. Mm -hmm. And then you don't make it. And then you sort of, you sort of languish. Yeah. In a state of, of, of non-accomplishment and it gets tiring. And, and I would say even, I think about that. I think that, I think for many of us, it is work. I think back to, back to the belief in me, some of the beliefs that hinder, that hindered me at one point where I can participate maybe in some areas of life, but it's other areas of life where I'm less experienced um, or I have less imagination for that. I think that, I think that sometimes to not have the goalpost or to move the goalpost for some of us 
it is a, um, it's almost like this self medicating. It's a practice that gives that lets me off the hook. So because I've never named the thing, I've been afraid to name the thing. And I'm not saying that for me. Mm -hmm. I, I think I've spent this last year naming more things um, than maybe I ever have. But I think in general, sometimes we choose not to name the thing because we're even afraid to get there. I think about that. Uh, our deepest fear isn't that we are inadequate, but that we're powerful beyond measure, the poem. Um, and so we're afraid to name it. We're afraid to actually shoot for that, that target. And, or we just, maybe we don't stick to it and we have a plan B in mind. And so we just kind of keep shifting it around for our own ego sake. So we don't feel um, like a failure or that we failed or feel inadequate or unworthy or what some of those base I think nerves that get triggered when we don't live up to what we want. But I think about when, when you shared that about the goalposts shifting, I think for many of us, we were afraid to name the goalposts. We're, we're afraid to really get after it, which is it, I, I, the, one of the words that came to our mind is agency where it feels like yeah. we, the agency has been, I don't know if it, it in some cases it's been stripped, through a traumatic event or hallmark life stages where it just felt like, no, 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 you don't get to be, you know, you don't get to have power in your own life or whatever. Um, but I think in some cases it's been, it's been, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Surrendered, um, abdicated. Um, but I think in some cases just immature, that just hasn't been developed some of that agency. Yeah, thank you for qualifying that word immature because let's not assume that we should be at some state that we aren't. Right. We aren't, right? We have to, you know, part of change is transition and it's that, it's that, it's that, it's that part of a breathing rhythm where if you're in touch with your breath, there's this pause right after the inhale and then there's a pause right after the exhale. So we got this, we had this change sort of metaphor going on with us all the time, but it's in that pause. And sometime in life, that pause is a bit longer and it's uncomfortable, right? Imagine if you just stopped breathing, it's like, where's my next breath? And so it motivates you to take the next breath. And so we waste the transition, right? And so, you know, so part of what we're talking about in this, in this, in this, in this, in this personal development is creating enough space, enough pause to examine the belief, right? We could talk a long time, Mark, probably more mm -hmm. time than we have about the idea of belief. Mm -hmm. So think about it for a moment, right? Belief is really a, it's an idea or a set of ideas or a construct that you've been convinced of by someone that you believe in, right? So I don't know how you rolled with Santa Claus when you were little, right? But let's start with Santa Claus, right? Yeah, it, it, it's so funny, right? I mean, I, I lived in a literal, we used to call them cracker boxes when I grew up, right? Mm -hmm. And we had no chimney, we had these little vents for the, for the toilet and the sink. And yet, man, I tried to go to sleep at night. So this fat dude in a red suit can come down a chimney that I didn't have and leave presents. And, but, but I was convinced of those ideas because someone told me that was right, right? And then I grew mature in your words and realize that okay that was fun but it wasn't it wasn't fact right so most of what we believe is not fact because belief is in fact you can believe in facts and facts you, you can believe in facts but beliefs aren't necessarily facts they are what we've been convinced of so mm -hmm. in this breathing metaphor right in that pause that pause is a space that allows you now to redirect what if, we, what if we were conscious enough through prayer, through meditation, through this silencing, silencing stuff to pause for a moment and to really consider what we believed and why we believed, right? Your belief in Santa Claus was probably intentional. Parents trying to get you a little butt in the bed so they can wrap those gifts and put them under the tree. But that was pretty overt. There are a lot of covert things, messaging, mm. what you ought to do what you ought to believe, especially in the church, especially in the church. I was talking to someone yesterday that was telling me about their beliefs and they said, you know, I, I know I should read my Bible more on my own, but I'm, I'm convinced of this. And I didn't, I didn't retort, but I'm thinking, how the heck can you be convinced of something if you're not investigating it yourself? It's the nature of curiosity. It's the nature of discovery. 
it's where agency is built. Otherwise, you are conforming rather than being transformed. Right? That sounds familiar, mm. right? Don't be conformed. <laughs> be mm-hmm. transformed. By the renewing of by the re- Come on. Of what? Our right? mind. Our right? mind. This yeah. place where we process and consider and and but without that space, all we're going to do in that mind is sort of reproduce and gravitate to these conditioned thoughts that we've been convinced of, and we're on autopilot. Mm. Create habits that create a reinforcing loop that keep us in the same place and leads to frustration. Hmm. Wow. So how does this transformation take place, right? That, that, it begs the question. Mm. Don't be conformed to the world. And, and, and by the way, this idea of the world is not, you know, don't smoke, don't chew, don't hang with those that do. It's not <laughs> the bad, the evil, the dark. The world really mm-hmm. alludes to sort of, the, sort of the spirit of the age. And so the spirit of the age, in, in whatever age you're living in, it's not necessarily sin. It's what's popular. It's what's vogue. Yeah, not necessarily what we would call sin, but sort of the ideas of, of keeping up with the Joneses and acquiring more material and showing up well, but not being well. I mean, that's what, and so the word conform literally means don't be pressed into a mold that someone else made for you. So we're back to leadership, right? Don't get pressed into the expectation that somebody else has but rather be transformed by this new mind so that you can prove, in other words, show up as evidence of God in your life. And you know what evidence of God in your life looks like, Mark? It looks exactly like you, mm-hmm. the real you, the true true you, the full you, the released you, the agency you, the, the, the aware you, the conscious you, but it takes a transforming. Mm-hmm. And, and I would, the only qualification that I, I just think that you know for those out in listener land washing dishes right now he meant you not just me <laughs> that is for each of us the i think about you know the the, the most mature the actualized the healthy the whole the non-dissonant the non kind of torn in different directions version of you um but that whole grounded version of you i really that that's meaningful that's really really meaningful yeah that's that's what we're after and we we don't get there we don't get there trying to do our way to it right Mm -hmm, remember mm -hmm. those three b's right Uh, and let me place those kind of in the context of sort of spiritual formation right the first key is to believe the second key is to belong and then the third key is to behave right Mm. people that are having sort of religious experience describe them in terms of what they don't do as opposed to what they do. I'm one of these because I don't, mm-hmm. right? Nowhere in there, we heard about this being, this being, right? It's a little more ethereal, it's harder to get at, right? But from Genesis to Revelation, uh, there's this conversation going on about the emergence and the consciousness uh, and the agency of an individual who mm-hmm. bears something in him that is light and needs to be shown to reflect that which is true and pure and light. But you don't get there by doing, but we've been kind of conditioned, Mark, and again, uh, who, whoever is out there in listener land, right? That's a, that's a collective we, right? That we've been taught how to behave, mm-hmm. right? What was the, one of the first lessons you learned back in kindergarten, man, or first grade, right? It was, it was hey, color within the lines. Mm-hmm. All within the lines. Here's, mm-hmm. here's, here's some lines, and here's a bunch of creative material at your disposal. But make sure, make sure you conform. That's the key to life. Mm-hmm. And we took that to each stage with us. Yeah. I, when you said that, when you, uh, as soon as you said color within the lines, um, I thought about, I think leaders one of the ways that you're able to, that one is able to lead in a different direction is because there's imagination for something that, for, for, the, for something, for a direction, for maybe a newer direction, a different direction. Um, dude, I feel so, I can't think of the Tesla guy's name right now. Um, Elon Musk. Elon Musk. This guy, he's talking about taking humanity to Mars and he's sacrificing everything he owns 
He's, I'm not going to waste time on this home and buying all this land that I bought. I'm selling it all. I'm really focused on this one thing. Every brain cycle, in his quote, <laughs> is going to be dedicated to that as many as possible. And I just think about, so my question is for you, a, a leadership uh, guru is what I call it because guru is just in my head. I think about someone who's given themselves to leadership for a long time. Um, how does how does someone get to that space where I feel like that's what we're talking about, what it looks like when I am being and I'm comfortable in my skin and I can trust the, the, my own voice and the unctions and leaders, the lead that I'm feeling within me over the, the whatever I've been conditioned to feel mm -hmm. so that I can start a new thing or, or, or trust that direction. But how does, how does someone get to that space? So let's talk about a uh, let's talk about a change model, right? That um, so 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 I think we use we need to use metaphoric language because metaphors tell stories and people remember stories and we're we're in essence we're a story based culture we we still are right we love story we learn from story um, so if I were going into an organization and they wanted to engage me because they, there's something that needed to change, right? They're not where they wanted to be uh, with respect to DEI. And I would say uh, the, first, the first work we need to do is around your current reality, your current reality. Let's, let's, let's locate ourselves, right? So think about a mall map. Think about going to a mall. You got your store you want to go to, the big box store. It's a new mall. You, you don't know where the, your destination is. You can name it right? It's, it's, it's Nordstrom, you can name it, but you don't quite know how to get there. You have to locate yourself. When you locate yourself, you see this red dot that says you are here. At that moment, Mark, there's a sense of this is doable, but it took you locating yourself. So that's the, that's the current reality work, right? So toggle, if you will, between corporation and individual and thinking about Elon Musk, you are, you are here. The way that you understand you are here, there's a series of diagnostic tools, but they're, they're all around, how do you know you're here, right? What evidence says that you're here? And what is this evidence saying about where you wanna go? Then the next step is to define where you wanna go. So once you locate, right, you, just, you define where you wanna go. Easier said than done. Is that where you wanna go? Or is that where someone thinks you need to go? In organizations, it should be easy because where you want to go should be your ethos documents, your mission and vision and values. Although I would argue that greater than 50% of the organizations I work with, their mission, vision, values don't mean much. We, we end up rewriting those because, you know, they put them up and they put them out and they sounded good, but they're not guiding. They're not guiding, right? So you do work there. So if you have a, a clear idea of, of, of your current reality and some clear and co cooperative nature around where you're going, it creates a, tr a creative tension that now pulls you. It pulls you towards your desired state, right? So from a personal standpoint, how do you get to that point? It's not about writing guiding documents, although I would encourage somebody to do that and continue to edit and to the really hard work is what's your current reality and what is, what is, what, what's the evidence that's upsetting you about that? If you can get real clear on that, you can probably start asking the question, why? Hmm. Right? Why? Because Elon's making a boatload of money. <laughs> he has every reason, right? He has every reason to just cash it in, lay on a beach and drink. But there's something pulling him. And he's in tune with what's pulling him. Most of us aren't in tune with what's pulling us. I, I love what you said about um, being pulled because I, I think about, I think that's the, that's the naming the goalpost, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Because when I, when I, I've been big on setting intentions lately. Um, and when I verbalize in my reflection, meditation, journaling, scripture time, when I verbalize, I will be present with my babies today. I will be patient. We will cook together. I will show up a certain way. Um, it's it sets the direction. So when I hear that pulling, it just feels like gravity. And so, yeah. if I'm an organization or an individual, and this can be, I feel it, this can be financial. This can be fitness. This can be anything. If I 
if there's no you going there, it doesn't even matter where I am currently. It's almost like when you talked about that locating yourself first, okay, this is where I'm at. This is the current state of things. To me, that is really important to know self awareness, self understanding, that's important. But I also think to me what's more important will be is setting the direction because I think when you said it pulls you it's I mean that's where we need to go regardless regardless of where I am right now that's where I need to go I can't get there unless I know where I'm at right now absolutely or I can't understand my progress of getting there absolutely. I can't create a roadmap there until I know where I am absolutely. but I can never go anywhere until I set where I want to go absolutely and, and there's a lot of fear around that I think uh, and a lot of people well, and organizations know. The oh, cost of change. Absolutely. So let's uh, let, let's 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 dive into a framework, right? Uh, so this is gonna this is gonna help some people. So think about an iceberg, a literal iceberg. Right? Mm -hmm. And so this iceberg sits in the water, uh, and what we see is the lit the literal tip of the iceberg. We know that the most formidable pa formidable part of the iceberg is below the water. So let's let's do a quick diagnostic, right? So you have the iceberg that sits on top, you have the water level, and then you have probably 90% of it submerged. So let's say that the top of that iceberg in this sort of change idea that we're talking about, right, is what, what we call event. So something happened, right? So we're doing a diagnostic on, you know, somebody says, hey, I will do this, but then they don't. And they know they didn't because there's some evidence. I, I, you know, that train wrecked or that, that person was unhappy or that didn't get there's evidence so our natural tendency largely in part to the way that we've been socialized individually and organizationally is to react to the event right to react to the event so we get after that to solve whatever went wrong there only to re-experience it again and then we solve it again solve it again and we re-experience it again why because we're creating a symptom so if we chipped away at that metaphoric tip of the iceberg, you know what's going to happen because the root is still in place. It's going to reform again. And this is what happens. Okay, so that's the evidence or the event which gives you evidence that something isn't right. You got to go deeper, right? So now you're getting ready to get in some cold, dark, deep water, which is not inviting, which is why we don't do it. But right below that are some patterns and trends. So if the question, Mark, is around uh, with the event, if the question is what happened, then for patterns and trends, it's what's been happening, right? Because you know that there's over time, there's been some repeated things going on that, you know, if you interrupt those patterns and trends, you might get a different result. But those patterns and trends are built on something too. They're built on what we call systems and structures. So the systems and structures in our individual narrative are mm -hmm. the things that we assume and believe and uh, that we have traditionalized and all those kinds of things are in these systems and structures and we've kind of developed life patterns as a result of that. Mm -hmm. But then there's one more layer that really anchors this thing. It's what I call, what's commonly called mental models. It's, mm -hmm. it's our worldview and our perspective. It's how we view not only things and people, but ourselves as well. So erupting from our mental models are the systems we build to sort of substantiate our models, develops patterns and trends that are indicative of our decisions and events that provide evidence of those decisions. That is true for individuals and it's true in a corporate world. So we react to, we react to events, right? We, 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 patterns and trends hopefully uh, are some indicator of what's been happening and but we adjust at the systems and mental model. The adjustments need to be made there. So we're back to where we started. What's your current reality? Right, your current reality is way under that deep, dark, cold water. And are we willing, do we have the institutional will if we're an institution, right? And do we have the individual will if we're dealing with our own personal situation to do that kind of work, which may be rooted in therapy, it may be rooted in spirituality, it may be rooted in relationship, but most of us, most of us don't do well getting there on our own. We need a bit of a guide. I, I appreciate it. I, I mean, I just appreciate all that. I, one of the things that I think about, 
I, I want to, I mean, there's so much there, I, but I think about it serves me. It has served the organization. It has served this department chair, or it has served me some of these beliefs. And I think what happens is even if I think I'm, I'm in tune with this in my own story that where when I think about Enneagram or personalities and the ways that we have adapted to our life's um, story. And one of the reasons why kinship exists is to celebrate our life story and to mature and to invite us into that greater story of transformation and becoming and being. Um, but I think about the ways that certain stories served me to, to survive. And so I existed a certain way based on a certain mental model. And I became a way because of my surroundings and my story and what served me and how did that serve me. But what served me as a five year old boy watching my parents separate and watching my reality shift doesn't serve me as a 35 year old man creating a reality for my three baby girls and and with my lovely with my wife Karen it's like that so but I just think a lot of times in life back to sitting down and looking at the mall map a lot of times life can be so all-consuming that we don't get that we just don't sit down to say where am I heading and where have I been and what you're saying is it's not just where am I now but it's addressing why am I here now because I can circle the I can circle the mall and I can go to Nordstrom and back and just around and around if I don't deal with why then I will keep getting the same what yeah 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 so uh I love the idea of story right so um Joseph Campbell if you're familiar with Joseph, Joseph Campbell at all is probably most known for his hero's journey or the depiction of he, the hero's journey and come on you, know, you, watch, you watch any disney movie or pixar and i just watched soul oh my goodness good grief jeez right so so in, good in the hero's journey you have a main character uh that finds themselves in a situation and they view the world a particular way and then there's some disruption there's some level of identity crisis there's some going away to face your demons. There's uh, encounter with sages along the way. Then there's these sort of enemies at the gate that keep you from getting to where you want to go. You have to conquer the enemy at the gate with the sages help to return to the place that you came from. It looks different, or at least it shows up different to you and you show up different to it, right? So Simba and Aladdin, you know, on and on and on but it's the hero's journey, right? But if you notice kind of the, the elements of the hero's journey, there's, there's gonna be change and transition. There's gonna, be, there's gonna be resistance. And then what do we say to resistance? What do we say when we encounter resistance? Do we retreat back to comfort because resistance is too daunting? Or um, do we face the resistance? Do we lean into the resistance? Do we embrace the resistance? Uh, who are those those individuals that we would count as sages, right? It could be, you know, Timon and Pumbaa, right? That are right in a sense. And then Rafiki shows up. I'm like all into this thing right now, right? Then Rafiki shows up and reminds him, right? Remember, you don't know who you are. Look harder. Look, look harder. Come on. Look harder, right? And then there's this efficacy, like you said, that builds and you return to face what you ran from. It's a hero's journey. It's the story, right? And, and, and try as you may to architect that in a non-disruptive way, um, you can't, you can't. So we're, we're back to this idea of change and we're back to this idea of the breath. You can't, you can't hold the in-breath forever. You have to accept the out-breath. You have to know that the in-breath is, um, life-giving the out breath is making room it's letting go of what you don't of what you no longer need to be able to receive something that you desperately need we live with the metaphor mark every day every moment that that's that's that is extraordinarily lovely i i've never thought of breathing that way and to, to, to hear that that way is is really meaningful to me i love what you said breathing it out is letting go of what you don't need and I think as we kind of head into 2021, 
I, I think what's come up for me in my journaling a bunch has, has been simplify. How do I simplify? Um, and so making room for what I really do need, um, the things I really do want to give myself to. I really appreciate how our conversation has has kind of lived in this space of what does it mean to transform and transformational leadership and contextual leadership, understanding where I am um, and what this means to me. Oh, I need to, I'm going to ask, I have to ask you a daddy question. Yeah. And then I'm, and then we're going to go to, into the scripture and to reimagine some scripture together. And we're going to reimagine Romans 12, one and two, instead of what we talked about before. Yeah. Um, as a dad, you have, raised um two extraordinary leaders there is no silver bullet talk to me about some of the most meaningful intention that you have had to raise your 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 ladies to be who they are um yeah yeah so there, there is no silver bullet um i i won't even attempt to take credit for Mm. Um, totally for who they are they've had to find their way i will say this that uh, opportunity has always been a watchword in our family how do, how do we how do we place ourselves and our children in places to have opportunities that we grow them identity development is uh, important the girls are biracial their mother is mexican-american take a guess who i am um, and so we had to be really intentional we chose to be really intentional about uh, their development and their exposure. But I did tell them, Mark, phenotypically, uh, the way they show up in the world, they're going to be seen as black women. No one's going to know they're Latina unless you tell them. Uh, and then what are the implications of that? And so we celebrated that. I, I, there's two things I told them all their lives, and they will tell you. One is, um, I love you. Uh, I can't love, there's nothing you can do to make, you, make me love you more. There's nothing you can do to make me love you less. I just love you. We always told them that. And then we taught them to champion each other. We taught them to celebrate each other. We taught them to be each other's biggest cheerleader. And I'll, I'll tell you something, man, to this day, you let one of those girls do something, by the way, shameless dad plug, and this wasn't a prop. So if you look over my shoulder- I'm already seeing it. So that the bottom is my, my, my youngest daughter, Britt Barron's latest book. She's on book number two, but the top one's my oldest daughter, Dr. Jessica Barron's book. So I have two published authors in the family, both award-winning award books. Now, is it about award-winning books? No, I think it's about the bravery. I think it's about the focus. I think it's about the, 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 the desire to be known and to put something out there that will probably outlive you and be in people's hands and be open to interpretation and you being okay with that. So these are expressions of who they are. I just tried to create some lanes for them that, that they wouldn't crash, but knowing that they would crash. And if they did, I'd be there. And they would bounce off like bumper bowling and come back into the lane and find their way. And I just wanted to be there and support and love my, love my girls. I love being a girl dad. I love that. I, I love being a girl dad too. And what I'm hearing you say is, which I think that the gospel says is that our uh, unconditional love unleashes the best in us. I think it gives us the courage to yeah. write courageously. <laughs> I want to say write, write brave ideas and, and our experience with courage to face and it, it, and not just to write about them, but to do those courageous things and then tell the story later. Um, but that the, the, the way that you created um, an unconditional love to me, that, that is my, I think that that's, um, it gets kind of weird. I, when I asked you about your babies, I, I saw your eyes kind of, you started to, your, your posture, countenance change. And I, as I start to think about mine, my countenance is changing too. When I think about the potential of me not being around, um, I think that they will remember me, you know, telling them that I love them. That, and I, I every day I asked them, you know, I asked them five questions and they know the answer is forever. I say, well, how much? forever how long forever how uh how high that's how big how big is the one i i all the wings but there's five how much how long how big how come forever mm -hmm. until forever mm -hmm. and they they roll their eyes they they're good at rolling their eyes and giving me some attitude now but i just drill it in them 
And, but, but I think more importantly, back to how we show up, if I don't do my work, then when I am triggered or some of the pieces in me that aren't healed yet, Mm -hmm. then I don't show up in a way that communicates that to them with action. And so I could say, I love them forever all day, but if they do something and then I respond, in a way that makes them feel because their experience is the one that back to what we said earlier about how we're interpreting the world based on these experiences that have shaped our imagination. Mm-hmm. So I have to do my work so that when when they do something that is harmful to them or harmful to a sister or disrespectful to me or their mother, that I still show up above the phrase, so to speak, of that, where I'm not reacting to that, but I'm still proactively leading them transformationally and mutually towards that 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 being that is grounded in unconditional love and that's the gift of the scripture and the story of the gospel is that that declaration of sacrificial commitment and covenant has been the stake in the ground since forever yeah and it's it's so i, I just really love that yeah right on right on yeah L- yeah, let me re- read go ahead go ahead the reality is before you read the reality yeah. is i I can honestly say that I think they've had more of a transformational impact on me than I've had on them. And it's because of that transformation that I'm able to give something back to them that's, that's redeemable, um, that is worth holding, and, um, and of some value. Yeah. What a gift. What a gift yeah. children are. That, what, a, what a gift. I'm going to read Romans 12, and we can talk about it for a little bit. Let me flip these pages a little bit here. Jeez Louise. Yeah, I didn't prep for this one, so we're going we're gonna to rock and roll. I told you, man, I, I, uh, I don't draw within the lines. No, I, usually, usually I don't either. We, the lines help us. They create the ballpark. They, we're, they, here, they, we're, we're here to play us, soccer. They help us Let's go. We're I'm trying to think of a we're we're in Yankee Stadium, but let's play soccer. And I'm right. here for it. I'm here, right, for all right, of it. Right. here we are. We're in Romans chapter 12. We'll read verses one and two. This is Paul in uh, the Roman Empire to a community of people who are declaring Jesus to be the son of God. When the whole Roman Empire is declaring that Caesar is the son of God, this is the God man. Um, and so the gospel kind of up unders that or is trying to turn things right side up in an upside down kind of um, legal um, governmental empire and reminding um, individuals of their uniqueness of their invitation into this kingdom into a different reality. And so Paul writes this to this church is he's trying to kind of communicate how he's experienced the gospel in ways that will transform this particular community back to contextual realities, this particular community in this reality. And a lot of that is transformational. Some of, of, of this particular book has been really harmful for our sisters and brothers who are LGBTQ or um, find themselves as outsiders looking in. Some of the language of this book has been used that way improperly, which we'll get into in another episode. Um, But here we are in chapter 12. Some of this that has framed our conversation without even knowing it, Dr. Ed brought it up earlier, I'm going to read it, and then we're going to chop it up a little bit more. So at this point in the letter, Paul is saying this, I appeal to you, my sisters, my brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That is Romans 12, 1 and 2. What comes to your mind there? What stands out to you in this kind of reading in this context? What was Paul's point? Mm -hmm. (laughs) What was Paul's point? Um, You said in your introduction to this passage, you have a, a group of people living in an oppressive state uh, in the Roman empire. And the idea of sacrifice, interesting language, right? So 
sacrifice was very clear in their own tradition, but also in the Roman tradition. Um, the, the idea of worship was not new to them, right? Because they had to pay tribute and things of this nature, right? You're, you're, you're deferring to this idea of worship, right? And acknowledging there's a higher authority. So Paul's, Paul's point really in my mind, Mark, really can't be, hey, instead of, instead of worshiping Caesar, uh, do the same thing for God. That, that can't be his point because that, what, what's, 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 the, what's the end game there? Right, it's like it's like the co-opting of power. So I'm oppressed, but I'm gonna I'm gonna conquer you, and then I'm gonna be the oppressor. What, what's right. the end game? There? You're right. just trading one flavor for the other. Mm -hmm. And so if you do a really close examination of the language there, because even though those two verses are numbered, that is the beginning of a part of a story and a narrative, and it begins with. Uh, giving your bodies as living sacrifices. So there's a, there's a conundrum there. There's a contradiction there. Body and sacrifice, body, corpus, life, sacrifice, right? So the idea that I think Paul is, is expressing there is as you do these things or become what you and I, Mark, have been talking with our listeners through for the last hour, um, this, this idea of, um, uh, of diving into understanding your value and not being told by external sources, not being controlled by external sources. It's really emerging in this consciousness, right? Which is why he goes on to say, this is how you do this. Don't be conformed to the way the world wants you to think. Again, it's not about the bad people and the evil people. It's about very well-meaning people. It's about your mom and dad. They want you to do A, B, and C, right? And I thought that was wrong. But is that you? And then going on to say that this happens through transformation, which is a key element of leadership, because something should change, something should evolve, something should morph. I think the Greek word is metamorpho u in that passage. I may be saying it wrong. We hear our word metamorphosis in there, and we're immediately drawn to the caterpillar and the butterfly, that this change is so drastic that the latter bears no resemblance to the former, zero. One slinks along, painstakingly, painstakingly along the ground. The other floats beautifully and catches your attention when it flutters by. It almost speaks of life and freedom and emergence. And the only way that happens is if we're able to, if we're able to create that space, again, this is this is, I believe, what the psalmist talked about a number of times. Awake, wake up, when I awake. It's not that the psalmist was talking about physical slumber, but this sort of autopilot malaise that we walk through life with, trying to do instead of emerging as being. So I think Paul's point in that, in that passage is don't trade one worship for the other. Become worship become the evidence of that become the example of that become that and it doesn't matter what then this other does or or request it doesn't matter because you've already given yourself wholly to the emergence of who you are which is the best representation of god in the earth that's what i think paul is getting at i think one of the things that stands out to me in this reading that I've never really thought of before that I think is in line with that is this is this idea of what it means like the holistic idea of what this means so I I think that <laughs> when he talks about first he's saying present your bodies as a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God um I but then he talks about this is your spiritual worship and I think about the ways in which the dichotomy of body and spirit. And he's saying in this in this culture where maybe they have been giving their bodies to say, look, we're watching bodies get burned, we're watching bodies get eaten by lions in the in the Colosseums. But we what we're giving ourselves over to is like, okay, but our spirits are fine. And I think he's saying, Oh, no, 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 this is a holistic thing. 
this is, I'm thinking about the body keeps score and the ways that we have adapted to the traumas, the things that have happened to us in our lives that make us feel unholy or unset apart or unworthy. But then we think, but when I go to that place, the church, or when there was places where I felt like because my spirit was okay, then my body was okay. And I just think that there's, I love the tethering there that I've never really seen before where he is saying, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Present your body. This is your spiritual worship. What does it mean? So embodied practice. And Paul, when he talks about flesh, he'll talk about the flesh and the ways that we respond to the world according to what we understand in our bodies and the experiences we've had, the ways we've made meaning in the world. But then he's communicating this cosmic truth and the gospel of yeah. this unconditional love that can never be changed and inviting us to live into that. And I think it goes from flesh to spirit, cosmic, then back to embodied. So then I embody these truths with my reasoning, with my body. I live into this yeah. and it looks real. And then we embody love for our neighbor. Yeah, yeah, preach, preach, preach. So, so here's what's problematic about us attaining that. And it's mm. sort of this uh, anthropomorphic God that meaning that we have, we have ascribed human characteristics to God. And so in so much that we do that, then we receive back from, from this anthropomorphic God mm -hmm. when we ought to, we ought to behave. Because this whole cosmic thing, so you have this game changer. When you said this cosmic thing, and again, I'm not trying to get all mysterious and spooky, right? But there's, 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 there are ways in which you cannot quantify God. And that is throughout scripture, right? We say God is spirit, but yet we refer to God as he and him. And so when we do that, Right? There's this anthropomorphism that said, okay, well, I know hymns. I know how hymns act. <laughs> I know what hymns want. Right? And, and it right? ain't always great. It ain't always great, right? And so we start on this, on this process or this, this mimicking. And you kind of started our conversation off like that, right? You, we're looking at these examples and thinking, do I measure up? And how can I get there? And so we go on this path of transformation, which is what, or excuse me, conforming, which is what Paul is trying to undo. So I think we would do well to start because to, it, to some extent, to a large extent, Mark, unconditional love is an oxymoron, right? Think about it. Love is love. To say it's unconditional is just to say it's love. That's what love Hyperbole, is. Hyperbole, hyperbole. It's, 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 it's a bit hyperbolic. Right. It's a conundrum. Mm -hmm. Love is love, right? So if you have to say unconditional love, it means that we've experienced conditional love, which is not love. Mm -hmm. are, are you tracking with me? Absolutely. Right. So if I'm going to put conditions on that, you have to be this way, that you can't love somebody in your same sex, that's not love. But we get off the hook by saying, I can love you, but I don't have to. Well, no, no, that's the, that's the anthropomorphic God, right? We've ascribed this, you know, God loves you, but he doesn't like your, no, that's me. That's you. That's our listener. That's not God. In this cosmic sense, we're being drawn to something that supersedes behavior. Behavior is not the watermark. Behavior is not the evidence because you've been around long enough to know, right? That people can show up one way and be something totally different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So behavior is not the marker. That's mm -hmm. why Paul uses the word metamorphosis, transformation, right? Mm -hmm. And the way that that is evidenced is not like, oh man, that brother used to, you know, smoke, drink, cuss, and now he's in the he's in the he's in the church every day. Still not the evidence. It's still not the evidence. You are you. You are the evidence. You are the evidence. Wow. Which means you know. Mm -hmm. You know the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, the old saying, you know, well, well God knows my heart. <laughs> In other yeah. words, God's going to excuse my behavior because God knows my heart. Yeah. No, you, you, you are your behavior, but let that take care of itself. The real evidence has to be in your consciousness, my brother. Yeah, I, I think when you said you are your behavior, I, I, I've always 
I've always thought about your, your, our behaviors. They demonstrate what we truly believe, what we deeply believe, what is truly about us. But I think back to the, um, you talked about the symptoms when we get to the why. Your behavior is just, is just exuding what is truly within you. Yep. And so when we are, um, when we're rude to the DoorDash person or the people who are, <laughs> I mean, risking their lives to do grocery stuff and the lines are long and folks are just encroaching on our six feet. It's just evidencing our intolerance for other human beings. And one of the things that you said made me think of holy, um, the anthropomorphism of God and the ways that we make God human. Back to, I think about the quote, one of the early church fathers said that God made man in God's image and man returned the favor. Mm -hmm. And we do that. And I think that that's one of the problems for anybody who feels on the fringes of the community of faith is that we we're misrepresenting God. Uh, but I think about back to the holy, the holy back to their our holy, uh, holy and acceptable to God, that word holy, that completely other. And it may, this is other we, we don't necessarily have language for that. That's the awestruck otherness of a thing. But but I think I'm probably stretching. I was going to say LeBron. There are some moments where you're like, that is that is completely other. That is different. Mm -hmm. But it, I don't think LeBron, I mean, that's, a, that's an awesome, he's given himself to his craft and it does create awe and wonder. Yeah. But I think about people, when you encounter someone who has done this transforming work and, and they can sit with you in grief and they can be present and they can be with you and empathetic and also back to leadership have a vision for a new way forward or a direction yeah. to walk out healing or transformation in a mutual way that's not abusing your personhood or using your personhood for their own gain um I, but i also think I think those those experiences are few and far between. I think we have more experiences of people reminding us they're human than people reminding us that they are holy. Yeah, and at some point, I don't know that there's necessarily a separation because to be come on to be fully human is other. I think come on when we want to show up in certain ways or or qualify others' humanity is is when we fall short, right? When we when we try to categorize, <laughs> right? So we're on a journey, right? And I think it's a good place to sort of sort of revisit this idea that if we're in touch with a current reality and we've identified a desired state, let that tension between those two be the gravitational pull we talked about earlier yeah. mm -hmm. that inspires your life. Knowing that you you aren't where you want to be, but you're not where you used to be. Come on. You're targeted, right? So we all have the same purpose in life. And I think that is, is to emerge and be light to life. Mm. We all have that. We're going to do it in different ways. But if, if you ever, if you talk to somebody and say, well, what is it that you, you know, I just want to help people. Most, most, I've not talked to, I've, I've not heard this response ever. I just want to hurt people. I just want to jack people's lives up. We all want to, because we all have the same purpose. And that's to emerge in consciousness, likeness, God likeness, whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. uh, holy is a word that we've anthropomorphized. I'm glad we're on this on this word, right? So we've so what holy is to us in our context is oh the brother or sister that's on their knees and hands raised and eyes closed and maybe speaking oh my gosh they're so holy. See, see we there we you know there we go again. There we go again. Yeah. So I can you, do that using our own metrics. Well, yeah, I can do that. I've done it before. No, oh, you're so holy, right? Um, but maybe the person that is the other or the person that's living their true life, maybe, maybe that's holy. Maybe that gets that this is who God really created me to be and I'm living that out. Maybe that's, maybe that's holiness. By the way, use that LeBron example every day, my brother, because that dude is just one of my heroes. Other. Heroes. Other. Other. Yeah, right on. Yeah. I think, I think, um, I think one of the things that's important um, to understand, I think for those who are listening, this, 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 I, I think kind of bubbles within me, um, that the same person that this is Paul trying to, 
the same person whose words may have been used to other you his heart as i understand it was to invite was to say there is no jew nor gentile there is no male nor female nor slave nor free he was the one trying to break down the barriers to invite everyone in to a community a sense of family a sense of togetherness a sense of belovedness that is based on god's demonstration of commitment um but that's this invitation that he's giving us right in in this particular part of his letter is into that transformed life where we don't have to conform to the images that we saw growing up or the patterns that we were that were practiced into our own lives that we're constantly invited into holiness into otherness into wholeness mm. and completeness yeah. that there isn't us and them that there isn't like body and spirit we are just embodying together and i love what you said about that light and that purpose uh, but we're invited into that in unconditional love just like you said about your kids that it's like that there are, there are bumpers and but that there's that there's trajectory and there is gravity to become everything that is within you to become yeah to actualize uh, to become aware, to become conscious. I, I really love what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a passage in Mark that talks about the storm on the sea and the disciples in the boat and Jesus on the water and and Paul's having this uh, Peter's having this transformational experience that re that calls him to get out of the boat. Walking on the water is not the most important part of that. And whether that is lore or that is an actual account, it doesn't matter. What's important is that there was some level of disturbance happening that Peter couldn't reconcile. And in the midst of that disturbance, there was this example of peace and being in the midst of that, right? Not trying to get out of it, not trying to, rec not trying to run from it, but existing in it. And I would rather be at a place in my life where I'm able to be able to exist in the confusion and the dissonance as opposed to holding on because I'm a sailor, I'm a fisherman, I know what it, be, what it is to be in the boat, trying to hold on to my comfort. I'm willing to be disrupted. You seem to be doing that well, Jesus, and in so much that you are, I'd rather be in that place. And then Jesus calls him, that's the, the literal word there, it's klesis, and it means invite. There was an invitation, because you've used that word several times and my heart just, there's a backflip when you do that. We're invited into these opportunities. Mm -hmm. So think about that, Mark. Think about that, listeners, what an invitation feels like. It's not a requirement. There's a bit of honor there. Somebody thought about me. Someone wants me. My presence is valued. That's the nature of klesis. I invite you into this. I don't require you. I'm not going to challenge you with hell if you don't come. I'm going to spark some intrinsic motivation within you that says, I care about you. And this is great, but the choice is yours because you don't have to respond to every invitation. So we're, we're invited into these experiences, man. I, I love what you said there because when you said that honor, because for in the culture that it was written, when you were invited, that meant you are at the level of the table where you're invited. Mm -hmm. So when there's an invitation from God, it's the honoring your Godness. It's honoring the image of God in you, the divine spark in you to say, oh, no, 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 this is possible in you. Wholeness is possible in you. Transformation is possible in you. No matter what traumas you've been, no matter how you've adapted to the stories in your own life, no matter where the end mark is or where you find yourself right now, you are invited and and there is a way forward there is a way to wholeness and peace and the way to be um at peace in the midst of the storm and there's a way for you to not have to we don't have to alleviate the whole storm there is a way back to that the jewish that, that saying about bigger shoulders not smaller burdens but stronger shoulders um there, there is that side i think about but but that the that the divine would honor the dignity of your divinity in your humanity to say, oh, no, no, I see you. Yeah. 
and and I want you at this table. You belong at this table. You belong in wholeness and fullness and holiness and spirit. Oh man, I think that's what it looks like, right? I think that's what it looks like. Now I don't know about you, but if if I'm in a boat with you know eleven of my homies and it's storming and I get this thing that I see Jesus and I'm gonna get out the boat and walk, right? I know what the chatter in the boat's gonna be like. Man, are you crazy? You can barely swim. You, you didn't hear God. There must have been something else. I mean, mm. imagine, imagine the sort of pullback from the community. Yeah. Right? Uh-oh. And that's, Leadership. And that's, what, and that's what happens all the time when we when we seek to emerge. The community wants to, I'm going to say that in a broad sense. The community wants to pull us back because our growth is a threat to, is a threat to their lack of growth. Our, our, our will is a threat to their unwillingness. And so it may be subtle, it may be overt, but we're not encouraged to color outside of the lines. We're encouraged to conform and conformity is comfort and it keeps those around us comfortable in a variety of settings, Mark, not just spiritual. And so we learn how to, you know, Peter could have said, you know what, dude, you're, you're all right. I was tripping, man. Let me get back in this boat today. Y'all just row harder. <laughs> you know, we can make it together, <laughs> which wouldn't have been altogether bad. It just, he just wouldn't have benefited from getting broader shoulders of knowing how to live in the storm as opposed to trying to wish there was no storm at all. Man. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm, I mean, we could talk about this for a long time, but I think I, I do appreciate the invitation that I think we are, we've articulated. Yeah. Um, yeah, into wholeness and transformation, um, and to locate, to locate where we are as individuals, to know that we are invited into leadership, that you are seen by God, the Creator, that that you are honored and dignified with the invitation that says, "I believe you can do what I can do. Mm-hmm. I believe that you can be a beacon of light and love in the world, like I was, like I am." I believe you can spark it in others like I did and like I do. And I believe you can endure suffering and violence without returning that suffering and violence like I did. Back to what you said about trading one kind of thing for another. I believe that you can lead in a way that honors the dignity of those around you like I did without having to use others to elevate your own platform. Yeah, It's incredible. It's incredible. You see the transformation there? And it's right where we started, right? Yep. This transformational process that's steeped in influence and collaboration that leads to something different. Man, you're good. Mark, you just summarized this whole session right there. That was good, man. I, either I did it or you just did it. Let's both take credit for it. It's hey, come on, come on. <sighs> you the man, you did that. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> My brother, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you so much. Let me... Little, uh, I, I mean, we, we got to do this again. We got to, there's, there's a lot there to be, to be shared. Um, I'm sure, man. Six, my, six decades, dude. I got a little bit in me. <laughs> Sisters and brothers. Um, this is Dr. Ed Barron. You can check him out at Dr. Ed, B-A-R-R-O-N.com. And if you need consulting in your business or anything like that, you can take one of his leadership courses. You can find more information from him there. You can follow him on Instagram. Um, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you for sharing your story of fatherhood and leadership and what we understand about leadership and the scriptures. So just know, um, every time we end these conversations, we want to celebrate your story. I pray that you're able to see your story and hold your story and understand your story differently. Know that we celebrate who you are and we know that you're on that trajectory. You are being pulled towards that unconditional love to become everything that you already are to actualize that, to, for some of those pieces in your iceberg to kind of some the unhealthy pieces to be melted off as you grow in your holiness, uh, in your otherness, um, and for you to become everything you already are. So we want to celebrate you. We do celebrate you. And we've kind of reimagined the scripture in the context of like the whole story in the context of leadership, understanding what does it look like is there a dichotomy? Is there this and that? Um, but to know that we are invited and that God sees you and honors you and believes that you can do 
you can spread light, you can spread unity, that you can be a beacon of that to others. So with all that said, you are loved. And we are family. That's just the way it is. Much love, y'all. We'll see you later. Peace. We are family.